in June 1957 at San Francisco's luxurious Clift Hotel. Eight of the country's most talented young scientists and engineers assembled for a secret meeting. For the previous 14 months, they'd been working together at Shockley Semiconductor Laboratory outside of Palo Alto, developing a technology that promised to be revolutionary. But in recent months, William Shockley, the head of the company, and the mind behind that technology had become increasingly erratic. Now, the eight were conspiring to defect, to quit Shockley and form their own firm, under the leadership of one of their own, 29-year-old Robert Noyce, a Midwesterner with a brilliant scientific mind and the genuine affability of a born salesman. It had taken some convincing to get Noyce on board. Noyce had a young family, and to leave sort of a known paycheck for something that there was no model for, this notion of breaking away and doing something different. Soon it came time to seal the deal. In the absence of an official contract, eight newly minted dollar bills were passed around the table for signatures. Noyce got out his pen. I honestly think that Silicon Valley begins on a very specific morning. That morning is the morning that the guys from Shockley don't know if Noyce is going to go. And he gets in the car that morning and goes with them. Those dollar bills they signed are Silicon Valley's Declaration of Independence, a statement that we are going to go out and start a company according to our own ideals and our own beliefs, and nothing's gonna stop us. On that morning in 1957, none of the eight defectors likely had any idea what would happen next. The coining of the phrase Silicon Valley was more than 10 years in the future. The unique business culture with which the place would come to be associated, openness over hierarchy, risk over stability, innovation over the tried and true had still to be tested. And the integrated circuit, the revolutionary technology that would usher in a new era in human history had yet to be invented. That morning, the future Silicon Valley was just a speck on the map and a most unexpected place for the information age to begin. Had it not been for William Shockley, everything that was to come might well have happened somewhere else. At the time that Shockley planted his flag in California's Santa Clara Valley, south of San Francisco, in 1956, the area was known mainly for its orchards, mile upon lush green mile of fruit trees, heavy with apricots, cherries, almonds. Marketers had dubbed it the Valley of Heart's Delight. When I was 16, I was living in a steel mill town in Pennsylvania and I had a free summer between my junior and senior year and decided to hitchhike to California. And I spent the summer picking apricots in Santa Clara Valley. It was just an unbelievably beautiful area with all these fruit trees. Far from the nation's banking and manufacturing centers, the Santa Clara Valley was not, at first glance, an obvious spot for a technology company. All of the leading electronics firms, Westinghouse, General Electric, Raytheon, IBM, then had their headquarters on the East Coast. But Shockley had personal ties to the valley. His mother had lived there for years, and the land was blessedly cheap. Hoping to entice aerospace and electronics companies to the region, Stanford University was offering long-term leases in Palo Alto at bargain basement prices. Setting aside land that could be leased to those companies was, I think, a very, very important thing. And so we have the university then connecting with industry. This has just created a terrific atmosphere for entrepreneurship. By the time Shockley set up his laboratory, a handful of other electronics firms, Hewlett-Packard, Varian, Litton, also operated in the valley. 
as did the Missile Systems Division of Lockheed Aircraft. Here and there, the agricultural landscape already was beginning to give way to suburban subdivisions and large industrial structures. And as they had more than a century earlier during the gold rush, Americans were heading to California in ever increasing numbers, some 3,000 a month in the late 1950s in search of opportunity. People came to California to get started again in their lives in new directions. The idea of the new is a very exciting thing for Californians. You're not as limited to what has gone before. For Shockley and the other entrepreneurs in the Valley, there was the genuine feeling of starting something from scratch. This was pretty much a technological wilderness when they came here. Like the early pioneers that moved west, they, they somehow struck out without really knowing what the outcomes were going to be. Like many of the new arrivals, William Shockley had made his name in the East. One of the most legendary applied physicists in the history of science, he had spent much of his career at Bell Telephone Laboratories, the renowned private research and development firm in New Jersey. It was there in 1947 that he'd become famous as one of the inventors of a tiny electronic device known as a transistor. It's a transistor, no bigger than a kernel of corn. The transistor is a turning point in technology history, and actually human history, because it's taking an existing technology and moving it into a whole new dimension. Since the 1930s, most electronics, everything from television sets to hearing aids, had run on vacuum tubes. They were behind the transmission of telephone signals, radio, and radar, and also ran the world's first electronic general purpose computer, which was built by the US Army during World War II and popularly known as a giant brain. It was the fastest computational machine anyone had ever seen but it had one big problem. It was the size of a warehouse. And these tubes consumed a lot of electricity, and they used to joke that when you turned it on, it dimmed the lights of, of the city around it. And you had to have men run around inside the computer changing tubes because they burned out pretty quickly. Vacuum tubes, like light bulbs, worked by heating up a thin metal filament. And as with light bulbs, the filament burned out from time to time, requiring the tube to be replaced. The transistor, by contrast, was virtually indestructible. The transistor represented a major advance in being able to do uh, electronic work with far less power and a far smaller device. What's inside the transistor? Dr. Shockley shows us using a huge scale model. Inside are two pins. The key to the transistor was a chemical element known as a semiconductor. In between materials like metals, which conduct electricity easily, and insulators such as rubber and glass, which block electricity, a semiconductor could do both, enabling it to act as an electrical switch. By exploiting the properties of the semiconductor germanium, Shockley and his colleagues had invented a device with the potential to completely transform the electronics industry. One of the first hints of what was possible came in 1954 with a transistor radio, which was small enough to fit in a pocket. The transistor radio quickly became the most popular electronic communication device the world had ever seen. By 1955, scientists and electrical engineers all over the country were racing to develop new applications for the transistor. Shockley had more ambitious plans, to exploit the commercial potential of the transistor and make it the cornerstone of a large and potentially lucrative new industry. He decided to leave Bell Labs, founded his own firm in California, 
and began raiding PhD programs and electronics companies for gifted young recruits. He knew Chemist had been useful to him at Bell Laboratories, so he thought he needed one in his new operation. And he got my name and gave me a call. Fortunately, I recognized who it was. I picked up the phone, and he says, hello, this is Shockley. He just showed up in my lab at MIT one day. I thought, my god, I've never met anybody that's brilliant. I changed my whole career plans and said, I'll, I want to go to California and work with this man. Robert Noyce, then a 28-year-old research manager at Philco, the Philadelphia-based electronics firm, was equally impressed. As he would later say of his phone conversation with Shockley, it was like talking to God. Just over a month later, Noyce was headed out to California, an interview at Shockley Laboratories scheduled for the following morning. It was a chance for him to be among the best and the brightest young scientists in America, a chance to work with this acknowledged genius. And Shockley was making noises about how he was going to transform the electronics industry, you know, with brilliant new inventions. I mean, how do you say no to something like that? Shockley touted his new team as the most outstanding in the semiconductor field. A dozen and a half young scientists of various stripes, physicists, electrical and mechanical engineers, metallurgists, tool builders, all of them rising stars in the field, all but a handful under the age of 30. We were all about the same age, and we had made scientific accomplishments on our own before that. We were very, very compatible with our scientific training and, and, and with the way we looked on the world. There was Jay Last, a Pennsylvania-born physicist with a doctorate from MIT. Chemist Gordon Moore, who had grown up in the farm country north of the Santa Clara Valley, but had spent the last two years at Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. Jean Erny, a theoretical physicist from Switzerland with two doctoral degrees and a glowing employment recommendation from Caltech. And Robert Noyce, a native of Iowa with a PhD from MIT and the Shockley team's resident expert on transistors. There was no one there other than Bob Noyce who was really well-grounded in semiconductors. Gordon Moore, Jay Last and myself, we used to get there at six and, and, and try to teach ourselves uh, semiconductor physics for the first hour of the morning. I had never seen a transistor until I went to work for Shockley. Bob knew and understood transistors very well. And talking to him was a way of really learning a lot of stuff very quickly. By coincidence, Noyce had been introduced to the transistor soon after its development at Bell Labs. He'd been an undergraduate at Iowa's Grinnell College then, studying under Grant Gale, a physics professor who just happened to have gone to college with one of the transistor's inventors. At Gale's request, Bell Labs sent over the technical reports on the new device. Noyce devoured them. With the transistor, Noyce knew he was looking at the future. The concept hit me like the atom bomb, he later recalled. It was one of those ideas that jolts you out of the rut gets you thinking in a different way. The transistor was still a laboratory curiosity at Bell Labs during that period. It somehow manages to get to Iowa, to a little liberal arts college in the middle of the country, and sitting there in the class is the man who's going to make it all happen. Uh, the odds are astronomical of any of this occurring. Noyce went on to study transistor-related technology at MIT, then took the job with Philco in its newly formed transistor division. Bright and personable, he was quickly promoted to manager, and just as quickly came to the conclusion that the bureaucracy of East Coast corporations did not suit him. Places like Philco and Bell Labs and IBM they were very large, hierarchical kinds of companies and businesses. 
and it was very structured. Philco was so structured that your status and your furniture was determined by a, a book that actually had your title and your position in the company and what sort of furniture you were allowed to have in your office at that time. And so everything was put in a rule book of some kind. It was very stifling and limiting in your own freedoms. Noyce wanted to be a scientist, to be in a lab all day, every day. He quickly discovered that he hated management. He had imagined himself as an independent operator. Coco was doing good work in transistors, but Shockley was the top of the field. And I wanted to see if I could compete with him, if you will. I wanted to play in the big leagues. In California, Noyce would get his chance. 